Okay, welcome to Think Tech. This is Jay Fidel here. It's Wednesday. We're live. We're happy. We have with us Dave Heenan. Dave Heenan, who just came back from Georgetown, where he teaches every year for an extended period. Am I right, Dave? You're right. This is about three months, uh, Jay, every year in the fall. It's been my seventh year. And we're going to talk more about Dave, but I just want to add that Dave had M M Mike O'Neill in his class. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Mike, Mike rang the bell, as you can imagine. He had uh, just uh, come off the pandit firing at Citicorp, and uh, <laughs> that, that happened to be topic number one, and, and he, was a, he was a good sport. He uh, got, got right into it, and uh, more importantly, really described the, the global economy as he sees it through the prism of a very large bank. And what was his grade? His grade was a a plus. I mean, just just showing up for the chairman of Citicorp in your class does not does not hurt. And Mike delivered big time. Let me tell you more about Dave Heenan. You know, um, he's a former Marine, and I think that defines every Marine who's been a Marine is defined by his Marineness, <laughs> and I think that's true with Dave. He was a business school dean here at the uh, now known as the Jay Scheidler Business School, but then it was called the Business School. Yeah. God bless Jay. <laughs> And uh, he's been a corporate executive, and I worked for him for some time back in the, what was that, 1920? <laughs> I, th I think it was the 70s and 80s, Jay, <laughs> right? Uh, he was the CEO of uh, Theo H. Davies and Company. And uh, he, then he went uh, to uh, the, the Campbell Estate, where he was a trustee for several years. Um, S still am, actually. Still, still are. And right. what, now they call it the trustee of the Campbell Corporation. It, there is the corporation, but the trust, uh, the estate, actually remains until the probate court releases us, which we hope will be in the next 12 to 14 months. Okay. Yeah. Well, you do everything. And then somewhere along the line, I guess he wanted to stick with academia, at least to some extent. Uh, he started this gig at uh, Georgetown. Uh, I'm sorry, George, yeah, Georgetown. Georgetown. Where you're teaching every year for, what, one semester? It's, uh, it's, it's actually an extended quarter. In the, it's a second year MBA course in global strategy uh, for Georgetown MBAs. And somewhere in here, Dave, you, you got into writing books. I did. Well, I, you know, I, I taught at Wharton in Columbia, so I was on the publisher parish track in my earlier days. And so writing uh, has always been an avocation. Then it was a required element of, of professional development. Yeah. But, but today, it's, and, and more recently, it's been a relatively serious hobby. But a labor of love. A labor of love, definitely. I mean, it takes for me having a full-time job uh, on, the, on the side generally about three years to put one of these babies together. I want to talk about the process because I know you'll tell me and I want to know and I want everybody to know how you write a book. <laughs> and Dave Heenan is willing to tell us that. So this is called Leaving on Top, uh, Graceful Exits for Leaders, published November 16th. 2012, just a couple months ago, actually, That's not true. even. Yeah. It's pretty new. It's fresh. So tell us what, you know, and, and the publisher is Nick Breeley, who acquired Davies Black, which was a, a publisher that you were working with before. So this is sort of a natural continuum now with Nick uh, Breeley. Yeah, and Nick's an interesting guy. He's very highly respected in the nonfiction world. He's a Brit who started off uh, selling subsidiary rights, international rights for major, major books, and started his own imprint about 25 years ago and has made a move into the U.S. so maybe 15 years ago and has had considerable success. He's a real pro. Oh, that's great. And easy to work with, right? He is easy to work with, yeah. So tell us about, uh, you know, the kind of choices you have to make. Um, you have to decide, for example, if you want to get a, a publisher like Nick Breeley, maybe one of those other publishers instead, sure. or yeah. you want to go self-publish, which I mean, self-publishing is getting more popular, isn't it? And Amazon is making it relatively easy. It is. You know, I think the, 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 the testament is there's a publication uh, called Writer's Digest, which is the sort of the journal, the Wall Street Journal in the field. And about a year ago, they actually did a cover and feature exclusive story on self-publishing. And in the lead-in, the editor, uh, managing editor, just said, you know, we wouldn't have touched this topic. It was sort of a giggle. Uh, not that long ago, but it, it really it, it put an imprint on on the uh, on the process now, and it's it's not only highly legitimate. It's for a lot of authors, it's been a lifeblood. You mean this this model of yours, the model of taking uh, stories about right. individual business people 
who are thrown into this kind of Emil Zola human experiment right. and see how they react, see how they do, and then learn from that. You know, yeah, that's it's, it's it is academic in a funny way, but it's also really interesting. It is interesting, and I'm, again, a former academaniac or in Hawaii academia nut. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like the nuts? Yeah. The nuts, right. <laughs> and you got to be kind of nuts to write a book, because I think we chatted a little bit that readership generally in the U.S. is, uh, is has been off. I think, you know, the stats are that one, only one in three people today read a newspaper, and book readership is, is down both online books and, and, and the hard stuff, uh, whereas, you know, having just come back from Japan last week, amazingly, about 90 percent of, 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 of Readership is still up, but 90% of their books are still hardback. The whole e-book thing uh, hasn't really taken yet in, in, Japan. In, in Japan. And you know, it's not that they aren't tech-oriented, but they they like the feel and camaraderie of of a, of a book in their pods. Well, it's like the newspapers, you know. It's a different experience completely to put your hands on the newsprint, to feel the paper, to spread it out and look more carefully, zoom in on a paragraph, whatnot. And so uh, I think books have the same, they have a parallel run to that. Right. On the other hand, look what's happening. There was a piece on uh, 60 Minutes uh, this past Sunday over the Times-Picayune uh, mm -hmm. in, in New Orleans, which is a sad story. They're sad. publishing three times a week only now. You know? Well, a Christian Science Monitor, which I, in many respects, grew up reading in Boston, is now weekly. Uh, I mean, it's a tabloid. It's, it's very well done. In fact, it's probably even better than the Daily was. But uh, that's for a number of, of publishers. That's the way of the future, I think. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you that. So we have, well, I guess first is, we have Twitter that takes 140 characters, right. which can hardly drill down on anything sure. and it can't express a philosophical thought at all. Right. Um, it can give you a link, but it can't do sure. it in internally. Yep. Um, and then we have, you know, the the demise of um, of, of real double fold newspapers. We have the demise of long writing. We, we we have changed our writing style to a couple of paragraphs. That's right. it, and that's all you need to know, kind of thing. Now here, books come along. And books have got to be a victim of this of this trajectory now. Well, and, and readers are time sensitive. I yeah. mean, you, who moved my cheese? The one minute manager and so forth is. Right, right. And when you talk to publishers, they they get onto that very very quickly. The old days of the three hundred page book. They'll say, uh, for most uh, this, this book is probably seventy thousand words. I haven't counted them, but it's it's in that order. And How they, many pages? It's about 240, mm -hmm. and and to sell a book at 27, 28 bucks, which is what they want to retail it at, you have to have sort of that level. But huh. but many of them are highly successful now, doing 30, 40 page mini books for 12 bucks wow. in hard copy. Per page, that's a pretty good price. It is it is good, but you know for for business readers, it's great. Take companies love takeaway stuff. They'll have their annual management meeting, three, four, five hundred executives there and if they can give them one of these things it's uh, it's an ice cream cone whereas they don't want to spend 20 or 30 bucks on a serious on a serious book and I have to think that over time this is going to affect the the thought process of yeah. the community no question it's just not going to drill down right. so and by the way you said that it's a 27 dollar book uh, but if I look on Amazon and I have looked on Amazon <laughs> <laughs> right. you can get it cheaper than that if anybody is interested in this book and you'll be, more, you'll be you will be more interested when you hear about the book we're going to get to that shortly but you can get the book at twenty dollars and thirty four cents okay and, and it'll probably remain out at about two bucks in 12 months Jay. <laughs> yeah, it's not. either that or the glue factory <laughs> So uh, anyway, I, you know, I think the, this is a, it's a kind of an asset, it's a talent that, um, that m maybe our generation uh, is the last generation that's going to be heavily involved in big books. Uh, I hope not. You know, again, having just come back from Japan where their readership levels are about five times per person uh, what it is in the U.S. and in Asia generally, I think that's the case. Uh, it, it, it has not seriously eroded, so uh, there is some hope out there, at least globally. Why should they uh, take a look at this book, Leaving, Leaving on Top, Graceful Exits for Leaders by David A. Heenan? Yeah. Well, all of us at some point in our lives have to cut loose. We have to let go. Uh, in some cases, if you're an athlete, it comes to you earlier uh, as a, as a footballer or a boxer or whatever, it becomes painfully obvious that your time is up. 
uh, for others in, in, in executive positions and the like, it perhaps comes later. But all of us, like it or not, are going to go through this process of, uh, of, of trying to exit, hopefully gracefully. It's one of life's most traumatic experiences. We tend to be our own worst evaluators of how and when to do it, when the time has come. Uh, it's extremely hard to get decent feedback, particularly if you're in leadership or business or, or in government where people have been blowing large quantities of smoke at you for a long time. In many cases, their careers, if you're a staffer in Washington or in New York City, uh, if you're a constituent, if you're a family member, to some extent, your livelihood depends on Charlie staying in the saddle and the last thing in the world you want to see happen is to see him fall off or, or or jump off the horse. Or Charlie would like to see you go, and his answer is going to be based on trying to trying to advocate for you to leave. <laughs> there you go. That's that. Yeah, that's the ultimate sin. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's 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 very difficult, and I, I think uh, you know for founders of companies that uh, that have their their stamp all over the the building and so forth, that it, uh, uh, it it becomes particularly for dictators for others. <laughs> Uh, whether you're Ferdinand Marcos or Fidel Castro, uh, as Castro once said, revolutionaries don't retire. <laughs> <laughs> you can't afford to. <laughs> you can't afford to, and and they have it right. So it's it's a very it's a very painful decision, and and people in the book uh, looks at uh, this issue through the prism of uh, prism of 20 people from all walks of life: business, government, labor, sports, entertainment, and so forth. Half of them exited gracefully. The other half, I'm so, sorry to say mucked it up. <laughs> can, I, can I insinuate a thought here? that This becomes uh, all the more relevant these days because we have greater longevity and there's opportunity for a next chapter. And so that drives and should drive, uh, you know, the departure. My other thought I have is that this has to be at least in substantial part autobiographical, Dave. Uh, I would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think you know we we all uh, we all go through this, and I, I think uh, I mean I've as you know as you indicated in, in your lead, I've bopped around a number of different situations, and uh, for the most part, I think I've got the timing you know pretty well done. Uh, I, I think in Hawaii in particular, well, let's face it, the you know the, the mobility uh, opportunities internally uh, with the economy and the like aren't aren't very generous. So the uh, you know the old notion of repotting every five to seven years, which I think is by the way about the right time, is that happening on the mainland? It, it happens more on the mainland, much more so than here. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you know as you if if you're in a senior position here, that whether it's in business, government, university, that's that's a very delicious position. There aren't many of them, and uh, so the notion of of cutting loose from one of those jobs for what? Are you going to run the hardware store and? Why Manalo? You know, what are you going to do? Uh, traumatic. It's, it's it's very traumatic, and consequently, many people stay in the jobs long past their past their expiration date. Well, if anybody is in this pickle, you know, they can always call SyncTech, <laughs> and we'll give them a job as a volunteer. I'm serious <laughs> about that, Dave. We never lose an opportunity. This is Dave Heenan. We're talking about his new book, Leaving on Top: Graceful Exits for Leaders. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're having a great time with Dave Heenan, uh, who's written a book published in November called Leaving on Top, Graceful Exits for Leaders, and uh, with a forward by Warren Bennett. We want to find out more about him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know Warren? And you, no. You don't own oh, no, I mean, you know, Warren is the leading guy, uh, certainly in the U.S., if not globally, on leadership. He's Warren is 87 years young today, talking about... Uh, a guy who was timeless in many respects. He was the president of the University of Cincinnati, but he's, you know, did has done a ton of books on leadership. A great guy has a chair both at the Kennedy School at Harvard and the University of Southern California. Great guy. Great. So you know, one one thing that strikes me is this is about leadership. This, this really, I mean, a lot of your books are about right. leadership, mm -hmm. but this one is about leadership, and it's about how a leader structures his career and, of course, leaving it to the guys below him. This is really important for the right. institution. Succession, yeah. Yeah, succession. And I think a lot, of, a lot of companies don't know about succession. In fact, I know a lawyer who specializes in succession mm -hmm. because in, in a family company, it right. got to be public somehow. Um, there are always problems about that. Huge problems. Yeah, of course, you're not Campbell Estate. We have gone through this sort of institutional 
transition uh, from a from an estate uh, trust into into a private company. But you, uh, in many respects, James Campbell got it right. He le he left on top. He crafted a brilliant will that allowed professional managers to come in with some strings and and run that enterprise. Hmm. Somebody's phone. This is a very tech show. <laughs> right. We we have gremlins calling in, right? <laughs> By the way, if our if our audience right. wants to call in, they can do that just to prove that we're live here. Dave Heenan and me. We, they can call at nine two nine six fifty four sixty seven. And if you can, if you call in, you'll have the experience of talking to Dave Heenan, which is something, and make your whole day. <laughs> well, you've got a pulse, and I've got one still, right? So. Anyway, can we talk about some of your examples in the book? I know you wrote about some important people uh, who had difficult problems about exiting. Uh, can you tell us some of them and uh, tell us what the lesson was? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, interesting contrast. You, you know, with, with, a, with an exit, Jay, you can go out head first or feet first. <laughs> and Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon really represent uh, two different profiles. Uh, Carson did it gracefully. Poor old Ed, uh, unfortunately, had some hiccups uh, as he transitioned. But Carson, you may recall, after, you know, three decades of, of The Tonight Show, uh, which was attracting 20 million viewers. You know, Johnny was the king of the night. Uh, nobody came near him in terms of ratings of popularity. But then on May 22, 1992, at age 66, he decided that he had enough was enough. And people asked him, you know, how in the world can you give up the best paying gig in TV history? At the time, he was making 20 million bucks a year for three 60-minute shows a week. <laughs> and he said, he simply said, I, you know, I, I felt the timing was right for me uh, to get off stage, and I didn't want to tarnish my legacy. And so he, he exited, and uh, on his last show, with tears in his eyes, he bid his, uh, his audience a heartfelt goodbye, exited stage right, met his wife, Alexis, wife number five, by the way, <laughs> whisked off in a helicopter to his Malibu mansion. And for the next 13 years, Jay, he was inundated with delicious opportunities to return to the world of showbiz. But in every instance, he did the Academy Awards, you may recall. He hosted those a few times. Mm -hmm. But basically, he stayed out of the limelight and finally, you know, said, you know, I've, I've got an ego like everybody else, but I, I just don't need it to be stroked by reappearing again before the public. Uh, you know, he did a hell of a job. It was a classy and smooth exit. Now, poor Ed, uh, his, uh, the most famous second banana or co-leaders. You know, you can almost write a book well, about that, yes, right? Yes, you could. Maybe some people have even. <laughs> right. Maybe you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, poor Ed. You know, Ed, Ed and Carson hooked up in 1957 and formed one of the truly great partnerships in showbiz history. Um, and, and were able to do things together that independently neither one of them, vastly different in terms of style and personality, could have pulled off singularly. But unfortunately for McMahon, dependency had its cost. And although he had a halfway decent run after the show ended, uh, doing game shows on TV in the afternoon for half a dozen years or so. Come down. Yeah, real come down. As he got into his late 60s, certainly 70s, and definitely his 80s, the gigs dried up. And he could not, absolutely could not handle retirement. And you may recall, he went through a litany of well-publicized health legal and financial difficulties. You may recall it. he's almost booted out of his house in Beverly Hills oh, and all, all, all sorts of problems. And McMahon died at, at 86, four years after Johnny Carson, but in very different circumstances. And that's really the message that, you know, you can either do this the right way or the wrong way, head first or feet first. And it's, uh, you, you want to be very careful how you organize it. So what do you say to those guys? And I, there are, we know, we both right. know them. You say, <laughs> Dave. What are you looking at me for? <laughs> Dave, I want to work till I drop. I want to put my ear on the blotter. Right. That'll be that, you know, yeah. the end of story. Sure. Yeah. What do you say to them? I think the key question all of us should ask ourselves is, can I enjoy as much and contribute as much today and tomorrow as I did yesterday? I mean, if, if you can answer that intellectually in an honest way, then you ought to stay put. Uh, you, you can croak at the desk. I mean, there's nothing illegal or immoral about sticking around. But if, in fact, you don't have the energy, you don't have the capacity, and you don't have the motivation to do that, then for God's sakes, don't tarnish your legacy 
but start to transition into something else. See, talking about legacy, that's what we're talking about. We are, here. yeah, it's sure. The, it's, the, it's the perception of the people around you about how graceful you are in the process. Sure. Uh, Howard Schultz, one of the guys I interviewed in the book, uh, when we talked, as, as you know, he left, the, left Starbucks for an eight-year sabbatical and then re-entered to transform, retransform the company. Uh, when I asked him, you know, what his greatest concern was, he, you know, he said, quietly between us, it's my legacy. He said, I, I want to, I want to, when I finally decide to move on to, and he's, he does a bunch of other things. Uh, I just don't want to tarnish my legacy and, and the company's legacy. You know, but this doesn't only apply, it seems to me, and I'm sure you have examples right. of, of somebody who's at retirement age and who is thinking of, um, you know, his legacy right now as the final statement. This is also applies to younger people. Oh, absolutely. Who need to move on for whatever reason, and they got to know when that, when that, when it's time. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, there are some occupations. I mean, in athletics, sports is one of them mm -hmm. where, like it or not, the, your physical body starts to tell you there there are signs to to leave. And you know, we've seen guys like Joe May, Namath and Willie Mays who didn't get it right and other guys like Barry Sanders uh, and Wayne Gretzky who, who did get it right. Uh, but for those of us in admin management and the like, you, you always, I think, I tell everybody, including students, that you want to have an exit strategy. I think that Dick Gushman, who we talked about, uh, a, a genius in the real estate uh, business uh, mm -hmm. at the, when he joined the estate, uh, it reminded all of us, don't fall in love with the property. Uh, <laughs> and, and when you buy one, you know, you always want to be think, thinking of the day when it comes time to, to trade it. And, 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 and that's a very healthy message, not simply for real estate, but for, but for life in general. Well, you know, in a funny way, it sounds like you're writing your own book. Everybody is writing his own book. I think so, yeah. And when they read your book, you want it to read pretty well. <laughs> you do, yeah. So you know, it, it, you you mentioned that um, sometimes you go out and you talk to these people, and I remember you did that in an earlier book. Uh, you you actually got on a plane and you found them and talked to them and interviewed them. And I want to talk about your writing and investigative process right after this break. We're back. We're live. We're at Think Tech. We're with Dave Heenan here on a given Wednesday. This is the ninth, isn't it? Yeah. It is the ninth. And uh, we're talking about his book leaving on top, graceful exits for leaders. And um, before we broke, we you know, were talking about mm, some, some of those uh, exits that weren't so good. And it does raise in my mind uh, some of the political exits we've had in the Senate, for example. Uh, after a long career, lots of seniority, um, but, but no immediate successor, no, no training of a successor, you know, no successor plan and all this. And I mean, it, it's it's not just our delegation here. It's happening in other states in the country, and the Senate arrangement sort of leads to that. But you wonder if that's the best thing for the country and in, in general. Well, I uh, I've got a chapter in the book on the Senate, okay. and uh, oh, uh, there's a fellow in there by the name of Tom Coburn who ideologically probably isn't totally appreciated in Hawaii, <laughs> uh, but is a term limits guy. You know, he is a MD. And uh, he first ran for office as a Republican in a district that had been Democratic since 1921, as a doctor in his mid-40s. Everybody told him, you're the wrong kind of guy. You don't have the personality. You're going to go nuts in, the, in, the, in, the, in Washington. Uh, he overwhelmingly won that district, but on the promise when he went in that he would only do three consecutive terms, six years. And in the process, he alienated both his own party. He took off. On, on everybody from Bob Dole to, to Dick Army to Newt Gingrich. Uh, he was, he was you know, totally disappointed in, 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 the, in his Republican cohorts. Um, and then he went back to practice medicine uh, for several years and came back in again with the promise that he would do sen two senatorial terms of six years, which is running out next year. Uh, and, 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 he, and he's a big believer in term limits, as, as I am, and, and feels that uh, the way the thing is skewed now with seniority that people are concerned about the next election and not what's good for the country. Yes. Uh, and, and, and I agree, with, I, you know, where in middle school uh, were, were you advised when you vote for particularly the Senate, uh, 
forget the D, forget the R, forget the I, look at the guy's birth date, because that's the way the, the deck is skewed. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. And, and we've been caught up in that. And as a result, a number of people, you know, whether it's Harry Bird or Russell Long and so forth, uh, Strom Thurmond overstay their welcome and embarrass themselves in their final years. And, and that's, that's not the way you want to exit. It doesn't allow for a succession plan of younger people to come in and bring new ideas, represent new generations. Right. And, and Disraeli said one of the, you know, the British Prime Minister, one of the, you know, the great responsibilities of public leadership is, is to churn, is to develop the next generation and to allow them to ascend into positions of power. And that, uh, particularly in the Senate, hasn't happened. Well, we, uh, we were going to talk in this, in this part of the show, Dave, about the, uh, about the personality types. And let me just uh, run through the list. There's only four. It's timeless wonders, aging despots. You really do have <laughs> choice of words here. The Comeback Kids. This is a great book. Right. <laughs> the uh, Graceful Exeters, okay? Can you, can you distinguish and define those for us? Yeah, uh, people, I mean, I, I found it were in four categories. The Timeless Wonders are the, the Warren Buffetts of the world. They're the, you know, Betty White's the actress. They're the Sandra Day O'Connors <laughs> and so forth, Lee Kuan Yew and so forth. These are people who treat uh, leaving as somewhere something between castration and euthanasia. <laughs> Uh, they, they are not going to go out gracefully, nor should they. They have not lost their fastball. They're able to contribute and generate wit and wisdom well in their 80s and 90s. They are truly national treasures, uh, and, and again, they shouldn't call it quits. How, let me, how do we know? Well, let, 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 let me tell you that they are in a very distinct minority of the population. <laughs> okay, <got it. laughs> they, are, they are true outliers. There are lots of folks that think they're in category one, but they ain't. <laughs> okay. The second group are aging despots, and they are like timeless wonders. They want to stay in the, in the saddle, but unlike timeless wonders, they clearly are past their prime. Uh, on the global scene, everybody from Mao to Marcos, Stalin to Sukarno, more recently, Gaddafi uh, and Mubarak all represent the aging despot char characteristic. Uh, Fidel Castro, who is another one of these characters, once put it, revolutionaries, revolutionaries don't retire. <laughs> the they third, can't afford to. They can afford to. The, the third group are comeback kids. They're an interesting group because they actually, in many cases, earlier left on top of organizational life or whatever and for a variety of reasons have opted to, to do a, an, a return engagement. In business, everybody from Charles Schwab at, at, uh, at, at, at his namesake company to Howard Schultz at Starbucks uh, to Steve Jobs at Apple, all were folks that came back in large part to re-rescue their, their economy and, as we talked about earlier, to preserve their legacy. There were other comebackers who were hyperactive who just want another shot of adrenaline. Uh, Bill Snyder, who I interviewed in my last book uh, at Kansas State, football coach, along with Joe Gibbs, Dick Vermeil, all return for a late career rally. And then finally, there are people that, that come back primarily for economic reasons. Uh, you look at the over-the-hill boxes of Joe Lewis to Mike Tyson to Evander Holifield, uh, guys that blew multi-million dollar fortunes but came back into the ring in hopes of one more big payday. And then there are finally my heroes, and those are the timeless exiters. They're people that, that get it right and uh, are really realize that lifestyles can and should be elastic. And one of the true tests of happiness is the ability to mold uh, yourself and, and uh, change skins, move in new and exciting directions. One of the folks is uh, Roger Staubach, who was a famous uh, football player at, at, in Dallas, a quarterback who, after he retired, created a powerhouse real estate company, the Staubach Company, which he sold several years ago for over 600 million bucks oh, to Joan Langs Wooten. But those are the guys who understand, in, in, in a really gut sense, the, the value of, of, uh, of reinvention, of changing skins and moving in new and exciting directions. They're, again, the, the graceful exiters, and they're my heroes uh, in this book. Yeah. What about, uh, I have to ask you about Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> you know, Jerry Seinfeld suddenly dropped off the air. Yeah. And it was a thoughtful, you know, uh, sure. a decision he made. Um, do you, do you think, is he in the good category? I think he's a, you know, I think he will be a comeback kid. I think there'll be a, <laughs> okay. or he'll reinvent himself maybe in the production side of the industry. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's a goner at all. I don't, you yeah. know, I don't, I don't think he's playing shuffleboard or, 
or, or, or, or lots of golf. You know, these, these folks, uh, Betty White was, was one who was, as you know, in her career, which has gone through all sorts of iterations, uh, has... has uh, Mary Tyler Moore show, yeah. Mary Tyler Way Moore. Back, right? and, and, you know, early on in her 20s, she saw the vagarities of the showbiz world. And she was the first woman, really, to start her own production company in both radio and television. So even during her down days, and there were periods where, you know, her shows were terminated, she had the production side of the business to fall back on, which she still owns. And so she, she had this platform that, to, that, uh, uh, that, that kept her alive. A, a guy that I profile in the book, very interesting, is Jimmy Dean, the country and western singer, sure. who was, you know, at the absolute top of his peak, but he also saw the British invasion, Beatlemania coming in in the 60s, the Vietnam War, the sort of the passions and the, and the heart strings of country and western music were probably going to ebb. And he started to reinvent himself initially in acting, uh, television and radio. And then he got into entrepreneurship, bought a sausage factory in Plainview, Texas, <laughs> and built for 20 years. He was the CEO of Jimmy Dean Sausage. He was not just the persona on television, but he ran the damn company, sold it to Sara Lee uh, for, for also a fortune, stayed on for another seven or eight years as the CEO. Amazing. Yeah. But you know, but it suggests that nobody who, who is doing anything should not be thinking about this. This is something, I think I, I hear yeah. you saying that this is something everyone with a career of any kind has to think about. Well, I, th I think so. I, I, I mean, if, if, again, if you have a tremendous passion for something and you're really good at it, uh, one of the guys in the book, A Timeless Wonder, is Michael DeBakey. Probably mm. the greatest surgeon, the heart surgeon, heart Texas, surgeon yeah. this country has ever ever produced, a phenomenal guy called the Texas Tornado, work ethic Jay that you would not absolutely believe, and he you know continue, he was productive into his 90s, uh, produced over 1,800 serious medical journal articles, medical instruments innovation and so forth, uh, created Houston in many respects as a and Baylor Medical School as, as, a, as a linchpin. The father of modern heart surgery. Father of modern heart, heart surgery. Uh, again, he's the kind of guy who would, if he listened to Dave Heenan and said, oh, I gotta quit and, and sell cars. Uh-uh. Uh no, you want, you want him continuing uh, to, to probe his career. It's just that I think all of us, uh, uh, there ain't many, again, timeless wonders out there. Oh, true. And all of us ought to, just as, as a gut check, given the economy, look, look, I mean, the nature that's a fragile economy, uh, downsizing happening all over the place, uh, we are going to have a long life. And it's important to develop other interests along the way so that your identity isn't totally vested in what you do. But it's, but it's ad hoc. I mean, it's every man, every, every woman on his or her own. Some professions allow for a longer career, some right. others not. Other, other people or situations peak earlier. Sure. So you've got to make a, a careful qualitative choice about this. Yeah, and even in writing, for example, there, there you know, a lot of great authors Harper Lee and others, uh, you know, a peak in their in their twenties and thirties. Uh, there are others, the Grandma Moses and and Alex Haley of, of Roots and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, Angela's Ashes, uh, uh, whom I think I know, of, I know who you are, but I can't. Yeah, think of uh, uh, you know, really found their niche in their sixties and seventies. Yeah. So it 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 depends on the person. In many respects. You know, one thing that's also inherent here is yeah. that on a given day when you wake up you got to say, I like what I'm doing. Absolutely. No, the motivation, if, if it's there today as strongly as it was yesterday, then keep on pumping. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, when, you, when you're losing it, it's, it's motivation and, I think, competence. You really, you know, and that's, that's where it becomes trickier. You've got to know when to let go. Yeah. If you're a professional, you know, in your business, if you're an individual, what I call an individual uh, achiever, if you're, if you're a, a doctor, a lawyer, if you're an athlete, if you're an entertainer, you want to ask yourself, you know, do I still have the skills and the stamina to attract and retain my fan or client base? If you do, again, keep chugging away. But if that's not the case, got to get out. You got to get out. You're off you're over the peak. So one of the things I wanted to catch up with you is on this whole style of writing. You you, you call them on the phone. 
and you say, hi, my name is Dave, and I'd like to write about you, I'd like to interview you, and then, uh, and then you go see them, yeah? Yeah, well, um, you, you get various responses. I've generally, I would say, Jay, probably 80% of the time, because I've got a track record, I'm able to, 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 to make the connection and, and do the interviews. Uh, people are concerned, though, that, you know, who are you, what have you done, are you going to waste my time? Are you, gonna, look bad. are you going to do a hatchet job on me? Uh, am I going to see what you write? By the way, the answer there is as a courtesy so that I don't muck up. Give them the draft. I give them a draft, but tell them they do not have any editorial license over any of that. Uh, and, and then you're off and running. Some of them, uh, you know, you'll run into issues like I'll talk to you if you give me $10,000 or if, 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 you know, you'll, if you'll donate as one person did $5,000 to the Los Angeles Zoo, and then we can have a session. And so you, you, you know, you do run into some of what that. What do you say to that? Get law, you know. <laughs> In the nicest you know, possible way. You know, say thanks. I'll make the next call. <laughs> yeah, but a good part of the fun, of course, is engaging in in these people and and seeing how they've lived their lives and and come to grips with this decision. Well, so do you. Um, how many of them do you actually go and see and sit with? Uh, you, you try to, you know, I, I try to see at least half of them uh, p physically. I've had some very good long extended phone interviews on and off, followed up by email contacts, and then talk to family members and associates to fill in the blanks. You've got to love people to do this, Dave. Well, you've got to, you know, it's, you've, you've got to be excited about people and wanting to learn. That's Dave Heenan. He's into learning and teaching. <laughs> And we're talking about leaving on top, graceful exit for leaders. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're in the last quarter of the show, and I think it's time for the takeaway, Dave. <laughs> That's Dave Heenan. We're talking about his book, Leaving on Top. So if I look at page 180, we get uh, at least what could be a checklist here. Think you're ready to say goodbye? Ask yourself the following hot button questions. And this is our checklist for the audience. They ought to think about this. Ready to make notes? Or you could buy the book. There you go. <laughs> I like the latter. Is your heart set on leaving, or do you remain in the saddle? Can you overcome the Superman complex, or are you too self-centered to subordinate your ego? Do you insist on being out front on every issue? Can you cut yourself loose from day-to-day -day duties and the trappings of the power and cede responsibility to someone else? Can you identify and nurture potential successors? And are you willing to delegate significant responsibilities to others? What role, if any, will you play in the handover? Will your family, friends, and the rest of the enterprise accept your departure? And can you afford that? For additional contributors, athletes, entertainers, professionals, do you still have the skills and stamina to attract and retain your fan or client base? How excited are you about the next season of life, the ne next chapter, as it were? And have you properly prepared for that? What are your other options now? Finally, are your goals in sync with your spouse's or partner's goals? Can you meld your collective efforts, your collective needs in a new life? You know, you have that as last, but that might be the first for some people. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. If, you know, if, you're, if your goals aren't in sync uh, with your spouses or partners, uh, they don't want you hanging around the house, <laughs> among other things, <laughs> then, then, then you're in trouble. I mean, this, this, this whole issue is a group, it's a family-oriented decision. I think that's particularly true, obviously, for family-run companies, where it, it, uh, th the tentacles uh, go in, in new and exciting directions. But for everybody, uh, you, you really want to make, make, make sure that uh, it, it, in the home place that everybody's prepared uh, for you to change skins and take on a new role. And, and the point you touched on earlier, Jay, can you afford it? I mean, there have been some tragic cases of people that thought they had it figured and wind up, you know, living to a 98 or something and uh, the, the pension or whatever dries up and the fact of the matter is that they, they missed it. Uh, misread the tea leaves and, and they uh, basically you know run out of run out of funds and, and you, you don't want that to happen either yeah and sometimes it's hard to predict all of the stuff so you know sometimes it's scary if you will uh, that, that would be a, a great concern to a lot of people I'm gonna run out of money what am I gonna do I might live longer than I think um, and, 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 and most people you know most given that and, and we've seen a bunch of that 
uh, and, and we see these longevity tables and, and all of the financial planners that you take 4%, you know, how much you're going to withdraw a, a year and all, all of the mystic numbers, they, you know, they, it's, in many respects it's like you're on a trapeze, you know, swinging from one rope to the other. It's, on, on the one hand it's, it's invigorating, but on the other hand it's downright scary. And if, if, you, if you mistime it, uh, woe, woe to you because, it, you know, then it's, if you're in the sandwich generation, it falls on your children or somebody else to yeah. take care of you. So, I mean, are there coaches out there? I mean, can I, maybe I, maybe there's a class in this, you know, I go to the university and they will tell me how, how my process should work, my brain process and how I can answer the checklist. I'd buy the book. <laughs> it's a hell of a lot cheaper than paying fifty thousand bucks tuition. No, I, I, I don't think I don't think univer You know, God bless universities. I've been around a bunch of them. I don't I don't think you're going to quite find the right course to to point you in this direction. I, I, you know, in large part, it's 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 personal. It's personal. I think what's helpful, OJ, is you don't have to do this alone. I think you want to have a concentric concentric circle of friends. Or advisors around you that, and this is beyond the family, that that can give you some, some some direct and and, and very constructive criticism of, is the timing it's also right? Also behind beyond Charlie, uh, you know, in the corporation, because you can't yeah. rely on that. You've no, got to have external. You've advice. got to have outside folks yeah. uh, give, giving you some sense of, uh, uh, you know, the next stage of life. I was I was telling you about uh, these two, not one, but two lawyers that right. I know, my, my, my classmates essentially, who were with big firms uh, sure. on the East Coast and the West Coast at a certain age, about, you know, Social Security age, they were told that they'd have to leave because that was the firm policy. Right. We really appreciated you all these years, but it's time you have to go for many, many policy reasons within sure. the firm. That's probably right. a good policy. I th well, it, it again, it, it uh, it's a term limits kind of issue, and it and it flushes out, uh, uh, you know, some of the folks that perhaps sh shouldn't stick around. It also creates, I think, this is important, fresh blood, new blood for the for the enterprise. Now, you know, what I'd like to see more of are adjunct professorships or of, of in your profession of counsel. I think there are other ways to cut jobs so that uh, old Jerry doesn't have to walk out the door and feel. Uh, sterile and, and nothing going for them. That th th there can be a glide path, I think, and, and we're seeing more companies today, IBM, Intel, and others that are that are nurturing uh, re returnees uh, of senior level because of the loyalty, the experience they engender. I think we're going to see a lot more of that, and I think the professions, law firms, and so forth, uh, can take a page out of some of those books. Yeah, I, I know one firm in uh, Washington where. The fellow retires, but they, they give him his office or sure. an office, right. and he can trundle in there anytime he wants, read the Wall Street Journal, right. make some calls, and trundle yeah. out. And he has a nexus; he has a, a place to be. Uh, he's accepted, and it gives him an identity. It doesn't you know? The thing is, in this process, you, you can't take the person's identity away. No, and like it or not, we live in a culture where what you do is our passport to identity. Uh, like it or not, it's in in large part it's a measure of our self worth. Yeah. And, to, and to give that up, again, is for a lot of folks, is, is frightening. Tell us about your, uh, your writing. I mean, uh, wh wh where is this on the continuum of your books? I guess you will write another book. It sounds like it's too important for you not to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, where do you see this going? Well, uh, you know, uh, this, this book, in many respects, is, is similar to a couple of others that I, I, I got involved in. One was called Double Lives. And there the message really was, all of us have another side to ourselves. And I think, a la this, this book, that you've, if you've got a fallback, if you've got an alter ego, if you've got something else to, to rely on, uh, the departure process becomes pretty easy, in fact, very exciting. Uh, the co-leaders book, to some extent, also uh, talked about shared power, which I think we talked about the family and so forth. That, that comes into play. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sort of on that kick, Jay, of, uh, of uh, uh, leadership either in organizational life or in, in personal life of, of how people can essentially be more productive and hopefully more happy to themselves and to others around them. So what are the options going forward? I guess the area will be business and it will have an element of psychology. I, I knew an accountant once who, when you asked him what he did, he said he was a psychological accountant. Yeah. That's what he practiced. Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm not a psych, I'd be an armchair psychologist okay, at, at, at best. Uh, 
but it, it, and, and a lot of most of the people I profile now are are not really business folks. They're they're people from uh, from from various various parts of life, and and in many respects, they're a whole lot more interesting than <laughs> my my peers in the business community. Well, to understand the community, to understand the structure of our society, you must understand leadership, and that seems to be the common thread. Now. Well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what are you going to do this year, and when are you going to go back to uh, Georgetown? Well, we'll go back to Georgetown in, uh, in, in the fall again. I've got a very interesting trip uh, coming up, Neri and I, with Hank Stackpole, General Stackpole, to Iwo Jima. Oh, uh, that ought to be very interesting. It's open, you know, one day a year the Japanese government allow folks to visit in, and Hank has been kind enough to uh, allow Neri and I to get engaged in that process, and, and, uh, and, and that that I think will be a very powerful experience coming. Powerful. In. Yeah. Touching for yeah. sure. Yeah. He was at this table not too long ago. And, uh, Great guy. Was very, very touching. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, we will both see probably him, I know I'll see you, right. at the Pacific Forum program on the 15th of January next week. That's, that's always good value. You know, I was one of the founding directors of the Pacific Forum. Oh, it's uh, a great organization. It's great. And of course, Joe Vasey is a legend, and I hope Joe has been around. Uh, He's been at this table, too. Yeah, great, great guy. And, and a timeless wonder in the <laughs> context of this book. He, Joe's never lost it, and he's, if, you know, if, you, if you're on his email list, you know that. <laughs> And I want to tell you, if you didn't know, that tomorrow, the 10th, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is doing its annual briefing at the legislature. Terrific. Uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, and um, it's going to be probably the most interesting one uh, that we've ever done because it goes to Chapter 2 of Clean Energy in Hawaii. Oh, great. And one of the, one of the subjects you'll appreciate is the challenges of leadership because Hawaii has its own challenges for leadership. We could do another show about it. And we could do another show about it <laughs> and then leave town shortly thereafter. Well, I wanted to ask you, in this book, when you write these books, right. you interview these guys, you give them drafts, but you don't give them editorial control. Right. Anybody mad at you? Uh, I think over the years, no. I mean, there have you know, been, been some squabbles about, you know, sort of minor stuff, but uh, but nobody has, has really been upset. I've, most people have been pleased with it. And I, you know, I, I'm, I try to accept, uh, or, or you know, as I, I do, folks uh, to select folks that I think have interesting stories to tell and, and and are really up for the challenge of seeing their name in print. Does it get easier? There is a learning curve to writing. There's no question about it. Uh, but it's a, it, it is a painful process. I've you know, typically my day in doing these books has been pretty religiously five to seven a.m. and I've been on that kick. I. I Right, I don't do anything on Sunday, uh, and and generally my Saturdays have been sort of six to ten, but I find that if I do that, I I can do sort of four hundred words a day, and all of a sudden you've got a seventy thousand page book. It's a great experience to write a book. Talk about a legacy, Dave. Right. No, it's fun. Thanks for sharing it with us on this show. That's Dave Heenan. He's got a new book, and you can get this book. You can buy. You probably should buy this book if you care about leaving on top. Graceful Exits for Leaders, David A. Heenan. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Aloha. We'll see you tomorrow with Asia in Review. Aloha.